Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, session. Uh, we'll be talking about securing medical devices in the healthcare sector with MITRE ATT&CK. I have three amazing guests joining us today uh, to talk through it. Before I have them introduce themselves, let me introduce myself. My name is Jose Barajas. I'm the Global Director of Sales Engineering here at ATT&CK IQ. Um, I also lead the research on behalf of the company with MITRE Ingenuity uh, as part of my, my work here at ATT&CK IQ. So with that, I'll let each of you introduce yourself. Maybe we can start with uh, Suzanne first. Uh, if you can please introduce yourself. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jose. Yeah, my name is Suzanne Schwartz, and I'm the director of the Office of Strategic Partnerships and Technology Innovation here at FDA Center for Devices and Radiological Health. And my portfolio includes medical device cybersecurity. Awesome. Thanks, Suzanne. And then Margie, if you could introduce yourself, please. Sure. Hello, I'm Margie Zook from MITRE. Um, I'm in the Cyber Innovation Center at MITRE, um, and I've been in cyber for a long time, over 35 years, and I lead our support to FDA, CDRH, and Suzanne in uh, medical device cybersecurity. Awesome. And then Ingrid, please, as well. Thanks, Jose. So my name is Ingrid Skoog. I am currently the Assistant Director of R&D with the Center for Threat and Form Defense. And I have the great pleasure of working with amazing folks at Attack IQ like Jose, but also pulling back to incredible subject matter experts like Margie for some of the work and ideas that we tackle. Thanks, Ingrid. And yeah, th thanks again, the three of you for joining us today. Uh, it's amazing to have such subject matter experts talk about what we're gonna talk about today. And really the reason why we put this together is throughout uh, you know, uh, uh, COVID, uh, we've seen an incredible ramp in attacks, right? Specifically ransomware. Um, these are organizations are overburdened with just general things they have to deal with, let alone cyber stuff on top of everything else. So the focus of today is going to be having a discussion around considerations specific to the healthcare sector and the medical devices that they have to own and operate. This is an overhead that most SOCs, right? Most cybersecurity organizations don't necessarily have to think about. But those in the healthcare sector absolutely do. So I want to shed a little bit of light uh, on the problem that we're dealing with here. And, you know, to start, I wanted to start off by having you each answer the same question. I think uh, you each come from a different perspective. So to start, uh, if we can talk a little bit about what are some of the challenges that you've seen organizations face when it comes to managing and protecting medical devices um, there. Maybe we can start with Ingrid. Sure. I feel good about starting because of, of this esteemed panel. I am by far the least expert on this, but see the incredible importance. And right, if you look at the membership of the Center for Threat and Form Defense, we do have participants who this is really critical to and who bring us these kind of issues. So, you know, from my perspective, it's uniqueness. Hospitals and medical institutions are very cutting edge um, of innovation and have one-off needs that you don't see in the typical enterprise, right? So all of those specialties and dependencies create this really difficult thing to get your arms around. And one of the things that I heard from one of our members, which really resonated with me, is if you've been in one hospital, you've been in exactly one hospital. Each uses technology differently, has different setups for support. And so it's a, it's a really big challenge and one that from our perspective at the center, we're excited to have people bring us their problems and see where we can do projects and, and research to help with them. Got it, that makes sense, I appreciate that. And yeah, definitely have a, a number of healthcare uh, practitioners uh, in, the, in the center. All right, definitely getting feedback from them. I know Margie, on your on your side of the house, the work that you've done is helping provide tools and capabilities uh, for so for folks know where to start and how to respond to things. So, curious your perspective on the types of challenges that you've seen with medical devices. Thanks, Jose. Um, we've been supporting uh, CDRH for uh, since 2014, when Suzanne organized the first public workshop around this problem, uh, with a whole of community approach. And we've worked on a number of initiatives for FDA in this area uh, that we can talk about, um, certainly during this panel. We've also, at MITRE, we launched a ransomware resource center um, last a year ago, December, 
to bring together some of the resources we had here at MITRE for hospitals um, and also links to other, other resources across the government. But the challenges are very uh, broad. Um, I think Ingrid talked about the uniqueness. I think legacy devices is definitely a big challenge. Connected, the connected devices in the hospital environment, the unique environments of the hospitals. So there really is a broad, a broad range of challenges. And I'm sure Suzanne um, has a lot more to add to that. So I think I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, Suzanne, I know you're, you're definitely more at the policy level. You've done a lot of work to bring folks together. Uh, so curious your perspective here. Oh, thanks, Margie. You know, the past several years, especially in the height of the pandemic, uh, really shined a light on some of the challenges that we're dealing with on the cybersecurity front. We at FDA look at the challenges from the standpoint of patient safety. Medical devices, after all, are delivering diagnostics and interventions when they perform safely and effectively. And their availability, specifically on hospital networks, whether uh, they are connected to patients directly, whether they are uh, serving in that realm of imaging or uh, uh, providing various treatments such as infusion pumps or ventilators or providing monitoring for patients in ICUs are integral to the hospital or healthcare critical infrastructure. And it's been an awakening because often people think about cybersecurity from the standpoint of IT or IT alone. We think of it at FDA from the standpoint of operational technology and what happens when the availability and capability of devices is put in some compromised type of position and how that translates to the ability to deliver care to patients. Whether it's a ransomware attack that leaves imaging equipment in a state of not being able to perform. And so patients have to be diverted um, from uh, care uh, in one emergency room to other regional hospitals. Those types of delays, as an example, can have significant consequences from the standpoint of how those patients will do, particularly if they have an urgent or an emergent issue. So that morbidity of patients, mortality, unfortunately, can be affected as well. And the pandemic, especially the height of the pandemic, in creating so much of a heightened uh, acuity, a more severe acuity of patients who are being treated in hospitals, whether in intensive care units or other units uh, or in emergency rooms, puts that much more stress on the system. So an overlay of a ransomware attack on a hospital that is the place to go uh, when uh, somebody is, uh, uh, has contracted COVID is uh, just putting again, inordinate amount of stress on the system. And it's something that I think has served as a significant wake-up call for healthcare providers and healthcare institutions at large. Thanks, I appreciate that feedback, Suzanne. I think that's definitely spot on and a lot of things to consider here given the problem that we're facing. And you, know, you already touched on this and it goes right into what I wanted to talk about next which is, you know, what's the problem that we're dealing with here? And, you know, overall, as security practitioners, we've seen uh, ransomware just be rampant, right? Uh, we've also seen through research through the MITRE Ingenuity Group, say, through adversary emulation plans, ransomware ends up being the last kind of action the attacker would take because it's just a way of making money, right? And that's also why it's become so ubiquitous. So, you know, my question back to you, Suzanne, you, you, you touched on this already slightly, but how has ransomware specifically affected medical devices? Right. Specifically things like are, are, are the attackers actually targeting these devices? Is it spillover? Any context you can help us understand that I think would be useful. 
No, um, it's an important question, Jose, because um, uh, there used to be this prevailing thought that, oh, hospitals would never, you know, who would ever attack a hospital? Um, who would ever target people who are vulnerable? And what we have said all along is intent or malintent or, you know, deliberate intent doesn't need to be there for a hospital to be affected. Most often, the types of attacks that have occurred, these garden variety types of ransomware attacks or other exploits or intrusions, they're not intended to hospitals, but they are, as you say, spillover effects um, or opportunistic. And unfortunately, as a result of that, devices and other technologies that might reside on those hospital networks or systems can also be downstream, you know, effect uh, impacted as well. Particularly if um, if they have various vulnerabilities that have not been addressed, and and so part of what you're describing, I think, is really an important point to make around shifting mindset. Um, and it's been an area that has been an uphill battle. Margie knows this. Um, in, in really, you know, convincing or persuading various stakeholders across the entire healthcare ecosystem that um, one shouldn't be thinking about, you know, purposeful intent in order to be considering the importance of protecting and securing and defending the infrastructure of a hospital. And, and perhaps this is even a segue in terms of the work that we're talking about here of preparedness and response that um, just like any other hazard, whether it's power outages, you know, whether it's things as a result of various you know, hurricanes or whatever, hospitals take on preparedness exercises in the event of you know, failures that might occur. And a similar mindset needs to be considered when we talk about cybersecurity within healthcare across the board for device manufacturers who we at FDA have oversight of, which, and we'll talk about some of you know, the things that we're doing, but also for the healthcare delivery organizations in terms of being better prepared in terms of what will happen when systems go down, what are the redundancies that they have in place that they can pull on. That definitely makes sense. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a basic business continuity problem, right? Let alone all the other things that you've talked about as well, uh, right? That, that the folks have to consider. And I know, Ingrid, through the work that you've been doing, uh, you deal with a, a, a kind of a, a, a different set of maturity, uh, right, across different organizations, right? Whether it's center participants, folks that are trying to contribute to some of the public work that you've been doing. So I'm curious, you know, how are these uh, different organizations with different maturity models, uh, really managing this today from your perspective? Yeah, you know, one thing that we all have in common, Jose, is none of us have enough resources, right? There is, we are far outnumbered with vulnerabilities and threats and assets than we have the people and time and money to secure. So we're all looking for ways to best prioritize how we put our arms around that and what we can use to get a leg up on our defenses and have some of that preparedness that Suzanne touched on. Our center is named Threat Informed Defense. And what does that mean? That's using the adversary lens to inform how we prioritize our defenses and, and better shore them up. And so a lot of the resources that we put out like you'd mentioned, the Adversary Emulation Library and some of the other projects are looking to help organizations with that prioritization and making best use of their resources. And I know, you know, Margie and the MITRE team can talk to a lot of the specific resources that they have written and worked on to help the community as well. Yeah, no, that's a perfect segue, actually. That's exactly where I wanted to go next, right? Margie, I know you've done some work around this area, specifically the Ransomware Resource Center that you kind of briefly mentioned in your previous. So if you can give us a better sense of what are some of those resources available today that teams can use to either be prepared ahead of time, right, or leverage as part of the incident response process, uh, that'd be helpful. So, yeah, the Ransomware Resource Center is definitely... Uh, where we tried to bring together a number of resources that would be helpful, including how a hospital might look at specific attack 
um, adversaries around ransomware. We have an attack navigator view there on the resource center. Um, the other a point that I was thinking of earlier uh, that's unique about the ransomware attacks, hospitals have, a, you know, well-defined preparedness and response procedures for other hazards. But I think what's unique about cyber attacks is the longer downtime that can occur from these ransomware attacks instead of hours to days, you know, we're seeing weeks to even months. And so really understanding the clinical impacts from these longer term IT outages is another way that medical devices can be affected um, in, in a hospital environment. And the, you know, health services, as Suzanne mentioned, you know, can't be delivered if some key devices are, are not available, such as a PACS system, right, for imaging, would have a direct impact on the emergency room, the operating room. Um, so a study that, that we did for FDA back um, after the WannaCry attack, uh, we looked at what, what was happening here in the U.S. with hospitals and manufacturers during WannaCry. Um, and we developed a medical device cybersecurity regional incident preparedness and response playbook um, that has been used. It talked about this integration of IT uh, with the traditional response plans, gave more um, advice on who to who to call when things happen. There's a lots of things to consider. And this year, we are updating that playbook for FDA, and we have been meeting with a number of hospitals and and medical device manufacturers to talk about um, experiences with these recent attacks. So I think it's very important that people come together and help each other with um, their experiences um, in this area. And, you know, another great resource is the Health Sector Coordinating Council. They've been doing a lot of work in this area as well. Margie, can I just pull on the, your thread for a moment to add one aspect that's also different with regard to medical devices? Often we'll see, you know, the recommendations that could put out around an attack is disconnect devices from the internet, you know, kind of writ large. Um, that's often uh, in an advisory that gets put out. Um, and while that is, you know, functional and effective to do in other realms, doing so to medical devices, as you can probably imagine, can have really devastating consequences with regard to patient care. And so um, uh, that ability to kind of try to come up with a, a quick maneuver uh, in order to address a ransomware attack um, to better, you know, kind of bound or narrow the scope of it is not necessarily going to be a functional means of, you know, dealing with the problem when it comes to medical devices. Yeah, that, that raises a question for me, Suzanne. I'm curious, uh, what are some of the recommendations that maybe are coming from the, some of the manufacturers of these devices, right? What are the scope and bounds of what we can disconnect? Maybe I can disconnect it from the internet because it can function that way while other devices might not. Curious if you have any insights from that perspective. Well, I, you hit it right on the head, Jose. The advice has to come from the manufacturer. Um, there isn't one single rule, you know, that um, that stands across every single type of medical device because they all deliver such different types of therapies, or they serve different uh, functions, um, and therefore. And, and how they function or what they depend upon and what data is being transmitted becomes really important in terms of what the answer should be or what the recommendation is, which is why as we work together with the industry around, um, you know, whether it's uh, an actual incident that's unfolding or, you know, preferably it's not that, but rather as vulnerabilities are discovered, it becomes important for the manufacturer to be very transparent and to disclose 
through coordinated disclosure to disclose what the recommendation is to the healthcare delivery organization or to patients or to providers as to what they ought to be doing um, as compensating controls so to reduce the potential risk of a uh, you know of any harm uh, to also uh, you know pre- prevent or protect against any uh, subsequent consequences of an actual exploit or intrusion. Got it. No, that, that makes that makes total sense. And I'm going to ask you one more follow up question because I think it's probably going to be on the interests of other folks. But you know, vulnerability disclosures that process for disclosing things in an effective manner, right, that that helps the community has kind of been a point of contention in our space. Any insights in terms of how the, you know, medical device manufacturers are handling it, maybe better, maybe worse, areas of improvement uh, that you can share, Suzanne? Yeah, um, we've seen slow adoption of coordinated vulnerability disclosure. We do think at FDA that it is an important best practice um, that should be adopted across the entire industry. We included it in our post-market guidance recommendations for that reason, um, and it has been further socialized um, in various you know, other uh, work products that we've delivered. It's actually included as well um, in our uh, legislative proposal, you know, we reference the importance of requiring coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And similarly, uh, we were very encouraged to see that it was included um, as part of vulnerability management in the uh, proposed Patch Act that um, has just been put forth as uh, really, you know, one of those key principles that um, would make the entire ecosystem that much uh, stronger um, from the standpoint of cybersecurity. So we, we do think that it's important. Got it. That makes sense. It's good to hear that some policy is being pushed, right? I think it's one thing for people to do the right thing. It's another when there's a policy there that helps ensure that they have to do it. Um, so it's definitely some good stuff there. Now, I'm going to switch a little bit here. I want to talk a little bit about you know, from the perspective of the work that MITRE has done is really helping understand the threat landscape through MITRE attack in general, and then more specific areas beyond that. And, you know, uh, adversary emulation, understanding the act, the attacker's intent, what their modus operandi is, is going to be very important. So my question to Ingrid is, you know, specific to threat modeling and adversary emulation, you know, what has been the approach uh, in terms of, you know, threats, defining those, uh, helping the attacker better understand the adversary? And where are we today in that journey, uh, specific to medical devices? You know, where are we today? And I guess, where are we heading in terms of resources for, from that perspective? Yeah, it's a, it's a loaded question, Jose, but I'll, I'll do my best. So, you know, the the title of, of this conference of purple hatting, purple teaming, right, is a really valuable resource where you get folks from red teaming and the typical defenders blue together to work out some of that, okay, if I attack you in this way, where are we going to be able to detect, respond, deter the actions? So that isn't unique to enterprise or cloud or medical device. That has applicability to all cyber. Um, Some areas are more mature than others, but certainly that's a really key part. Um, something else I want to kind of touch on that MITRE has a long history of doing is standardization work, making sure that the community can talk all around the same terms, whether it be the common vulnerability enumeration, CVE work, all the way to, as you mentioned, the attack framework, being able to talk about the same techniques that an adversary is using and how those inform our defenses and and what we're doing. So I think there's more that can be done around standardization in order to help the medical device community be knowing that we're talking about the same things and and helping everyone to do those defenses. Another thing that I could I could add um, is the emphasis on threat modeling for medical devices. Um, FDA has been encouraging widespread adoption 
of threat modeling, you know, throughout the medical device life cycle from the earliest stages of design. And we uh, partnered with MDIC, the Medical Device Innovation Consortium, and Adam Shostak um, and several FDA medical device experts to run a series of boot camps for manufacturers uh, over the last two years. And then we published a playbook based on those learnings that was just released in November. So I think threat modeling is really a key tool for manufacturers, you know, as they are designing and developing medical devices and will be a tool for their customers in the future, you know, as you apply then the the larger threat modeling environment of, of a hospital. I will emphasize it even further. <laughs> uh, everything that Margie said, plus uh, hot off the press last Thursday or whenever it was, um, April 7th, I gather, uh, was the release of our draft pre-market cybersecurity guidance. This is an update to one that we had put out years back, and it continues to raise the bar with respect to what we expect manufacturers to do as they prepare to provide to FDA pre-market submissions before devices can go on the market. And we've emphasized the importance of threat modeling. But I'm looking um, at this guidance right now as we're speaking, and it is called out specifically in the table of contents. There is a section there specifically on threat modeling. Uh, and, um, you know, we can't um, uh, we can't say this often enough. The importance of a manufacturer considering during the design of a, uh, a new device, um, how that device could potentially be. Uh, uh, exploited, what are the ways in, and to really think like the adversary, to consider that as part of the process, but to do it in a scientifically rigorous, a methodologic manner. And we want to see that information as part of the pre-market documentation so that we know that there has been a real uh, systematic effort to address what are the modes by which this device could be potentially um, compromised and how the manufacturer has given that consideration and what have they done about it. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Kevin Fu, who's been our acting director of medical device cybersecurity, says to, you know, uh, to industry and others when we speak about this, it's very much akin to failure analysis, which is something that medical device manufacturers are well aware of and is part and parcel of what they do in the design of new devices. Yeah, that, make, that makes sense to me, Suzanne. And that brings me back, uh, I, I'm thinking about the community that we have today around MITRE. Uh, specifically, I know some healthcare organizations are a part of that. I also know there's a plethora of folks willing to contribute. So curious, Ingrid, you know, given uh, the work that you're doing today, right, what are opportunities uh, for maybe, you know, folks on the call today, uh, you know, that are working with medical devices as they have findings, you know, how can they contribute back to the community so that others that might have similar architecture, might have similar devices, uh, can learn from the lessons that the, the field is, 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 uh, is experiencing? Yeah, great question. So... One of the things that the center is perfectly situated to do is we want your hard problems, right? We appreciate when either members or just the general community come to us with, here is an issue we have, and it feels like a very good fit maybe for the center to tackle it with the world-class institutions that are part of our membership and with the fantastic expertise of MITRE staff like Margie and our other colleagues who can come in and advise on these very important issues. So the number one thing I have to say is come to us with your, your challenges. We really want to hear them and hopefully some of those can turn into projects that we then release out into the community to help everyone. Excellent, excellent. Now, we've talked a little bit about essentially uh, the effect of ransomware on these devices, the importance of threat modeling and understanding things from that perspective. 
you know, I want folks on the call to, to understand a little bit more about what the impact uh, of these things might be, right? If things go wrong and how we might respond to that. So I'm curious, you know, Margie, I know you, we have an entire re- ransomware resource center, but curious, you know, if, you know, that elevator kind of talk, chat with someone, what would be some pieces of advice you'd give them if they are in a position where they are compromised and obviously they need to react fast? Uh, what are some considerations that they should have in mind that maybe, you know, others uh, have learned uh, as part of their process? I think the, the main thing that we want to stress is the preparedness piece of that, because you don't want to be meeting people at the time that you have, that you're dealing with an attack. So um, working on the regional relationships ahead of time, the government relationships, thinking about um, for a hospital, Suzanne brought up the issue of disconnection, you know, as more and more hospitals are um, centralizing functions, thinking about and really understanding the impacts of a disconnection, a disconnection from the Internet, a disconnection between two hospitals, a medical device that's disconnected from its cloud component, um, being disconnected from the EHR. There's definitely a lot of um, high impact from these disconnections and really understanding what all the clinical clinical impacts are there. I think the the regional piece is important too, which is why we had that as part of our incident response playbook, because there is a lot of confusion about who to call when it does happen. You know, in in the healthcare space, there are well defined uh, procedures for other hazards. They have a Department of Health point of contact that they call. Um, you know, better integrating all of the the government side, right? CISA has a lot of resources uh, for people. The FBI is very involved. The regional fusion center. So I think there's thinking about it all up front, doing exercises, including your partners in those exercises, I think that's really the most critical thing that can be done. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I think what we like to talk about here is, you know, being prepared, making sure that the basics are in place and having, you know, uh, a manual or a process. And to your point, the connections ahead of time is super important, not just in what we're talking about today, but I think in general, right? When we talk about cybersecurity, um, and that leads me to think a little bit about some of the policy that maybe is coming from, from your group, uh, Suzanne and others. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about how that's changed the way the manufacturers are maybe providing more context, a little bit more detail. I'm curious in terms of, you know, the folks that actually have to own and operate the devices uh, and the hospitals, what changes have you seen, you know, the policy make at that level and the way that they operate their hospitals today? FDA's role is primarily on um, oversight on the industry, on the medical device manufacturers. We recognize that obviously this is a, an entire ecosystem and uh, addressing one stakeholder piece of the ecosystem isn't going to you know, fully remedy uh, the entire landscape, um, which speaks to the point of how we really need to be working together uh, across the different uh, groups. And uh, to point to an example uh, that Margie pointed out earlier, the Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council, the HSCC, which really resides as a public-private partnership under um, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, brings together uh, healthcare delivery organizations, hospitals, um, uh, with industry, with government uh, as well, and other other types of vendors in order to collectively sit and work on areas that are gaps, um, addressing what those gaps are, whether it's through various kind of best practices, recommendations, or whether it is really seeking to do an analysis of uh, need for additional policies uh, to be put in place. Um, I I think that there's been some tremendous work that has been done um, through these efforts and through what is um, uh, uh, called uh, the HICCP, the HICP, which um, is a compilation of the types of practices that healthcare institutions, that hospitals um, can 
uh, uh, look to adopt and put into practice, um, the hiccup really kind of emerges out of a what was a mandate um, several years ago in 2015 when uh, the Cybersecurity Information Security Act um, was put in place and the department was, you know, was charged with working together with stakeholders to develop what would essentially be kind of even a crosswalk to uh, you know, uh, some of the, the work that NIST has done in providing owners and operators end users uh, of uh, systems, and here we're talking about healthcare, with what they can and should be doing to better improve or enhance security uh, and be better uh, ready you know, to deal with different types of um, events that arise. It's clearly an evolving area. Um, There's work to be done in bringing more stakeholders to the table, I would say, from the government side as well, Um, especially as it concerns uh, healthcare uh, user facilities, um, since that's an area that I think does often feel as though, um, number one, they're not well resourced often. Um, and the uh, ability to provide the best in class of security is is very, very variable um, from, as we said, from one hospital to another, from one geographic area to another. So a lot of opportunity to do better in that realm. Um, we at FDA, because of the work that we're doing on the medical device side, feel we, we own that piece. That's our responsibility, and we're going to continue driving that forward. Um, things like um, the expectation that manufacturers provide a software bill of materials, an SBOM, is, a, in other words, another tool that will help owners and operators in terms of being able to do their asset management be able to do their risk assessments. Uh, but, you know, uh, these are various steps we can take. They, they don't cross over to the entirety of being able to serve um, all of the needs of healthcare, care, which uh, you know, really needs to be undertaken as we go forward. Yeah, I appreciate that. Appreciate that feedback, Suzanne. And, you know, each of you come from uh, these organizations that have far reaching impact in terms of the community resource wise. So I want to finish off by having each of you, you know, share a little bit of what you want folks on the call to know, right? We have a mix from analysts to directors to C-level executives here. So curious, you know, what do you want them to know or learn about uh, given each of your perspective? And maybe we can start with Margie uh, and, and see what you want to let the folks know uh, beyond what you've already shared today. Well, it's interesting Thinking back for, through my career, you know, I, I was involved in the standards work from the beginning of CVE. So we have watched this evolution. And um, my experience in the health sector, you know, for the last eight years has been so meaningful um, when you realize that the impacts can really affect patient safety. So I think that since we have an audience of lots of cybersecurity personnel, I think understanding um, the, the unique aspects of this sector, um, there's really a lot of work to be done. I think that the focus we've had on, on threat modeling has been, has been really uh, rewarding too. I think it is a way to really be thinking about this from the beginnings, but there's still a lot more to do, especially in this sector. So very important work. Absolutely. We all have to continue to work together on this, right? Uh, this is a, this is why I love being in cybersecurity. It's a continuous, right? I like to call it that cat and mouse game. It never gets old, but unfortunately that means that we're constantly dealing with these challenges and you know, all the work that the three of you do, you know, help us be better in those areas. So I think, Ingrid, I'd like to hear a little bit from you. You know, what would you like the folks on the call to know, learn about, or maybe how they can help contribute to the projects that you're involved in? Yeah, thanks, Jose. I think for my end of things, I already did the call to action of if you have ideas and problems, feel free to bring them to the Center for Threat Informed Defense and see if we want to have a conversation about how that could fit of being an R&D project that we tackle. But then also, please look at the work that we've put out there. We touched a bit on the adversary emulation library and some of the other 
attack related projects that we've published. Those are open for the community to use and help in your work. Um, I'll tease one that's coming out next month will involve a top 10 attack ransomware list and a calculator to be able to prioritize adversary techniques for your own environment. Um, so hoping that to hear from the community about how that might help your needs as well. Excellent. I'm actually really excited for that project. I think uh, that's super useful for organizations. And I think at the end of the day, there's a huge opportunity, right? We don't have to solve this by ourselves. Uh, again, the work that the three of you do, especially in, in uh, you know the MITRE Ingenuity Group uh, uh, and, and the projects that they put out, is a huge opportunity for all of us to come together and kind of solve this problem as well. So, and I'll end with you, Suzanne. You know, curious, uh, you know, your feedback in terms of what you want folks to know and learn about further uh, as well. Yeah, um, one thing we didn't really spend all that much time talking about, but it's a huge challenge, is the legacy debt that the healthcare sector owns. Um, and uh, remains a big complexity as far as addressing. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the objective of the guidance that we did just put out as draft, um, and that is open for comment. Um, so plug in there that um, this uh, comment period will be open until July 7th. Um, but the, the objective is... What we do now in terms of building and designing new devices, if done properly, will help us in terms of getting rid of the legacy devices of tomorrow, right? Um, we have very little in the way of options available working together the device industry, with healthcare delivery organizations as to what we can do with a lot of what's presently out there and in use. We know that this is you know, uh, huge in terms of capital investments that hospitals make, devices that presently work clinically, but that present real huge exposures from a cybersecurity perspective and cannot necessarily be updated and addressed. So the whole point of really trying to lean forward on the pre-market side is to have that forethought as to what we're going to do so that products that remain in clinical use for their entire lifetime are able to be addressed and maintained as securable throughout their lifetime as well. Not only do they perform safely, effectively, but they don't provide a nidus for entry with regard to cyber attacks, ransomware attacks, or whatever it may be. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, and I think what, what I've heard theme-wise, uh, one, I really love the openness that we have here, right, through the projects that each of you has, has put out there. You know, 15 years ago, uh, people didn't want to talk about the controls that they had. They didn't want to talk about the hardware that they had. And now we have this forum that we're able to talk openly about these things. Um, and the other thing I've heard theme-wise is, you know, just putting an emphasis on orgs, really practicing and exercising their incident response. And talking to the three of you today, I think it's even more so important when you're dealing with these medical devices, because if you're making the right choice or you don't know what to do, it can definitely have a detrimental impact at the end of the day where your focus is, which is the patient, right? So for organizations that are dealing with that, uh, you know, here at Attack IQ, that's what we do. We help exercise your controls. I think if you're in this space, what I'm hearing, it's even more important that you do so, so that you know exactly what to do and you take the right action and you understand the impact of those actions as you take them as part of that process. So with that, I want to thank the three of you for being here today. I really appreciate your time. This has been extremely meaningful and I think the community will definitely appreciate it. Um, and for those of you uh, listening to this today, I hope you enjoy the rest of Purple Hats um, and, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cool.